I'm the Practice Development Officer at the Alzheimer's Society and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our work in this area to date and some of the special considerations that we need to take into account when um, we think about um, people with dementia. And you'll notice that um, I'm the Practice Development Officer, not an assistive uh, technology specialist, but um, just as Stephen mentioned earlier, we're there now, so I'm in a voluntary body that needs to keep up. So Ireland is certainly ageing and um, as we age our risk of um, dementia does increase and um, however it's not necessarily a part of ageing and um, we have 44,000 people in Ireland um, around 44,000 people in Ireland with dementia currently about 50,000 carers involved in their care and um, we'll see the numbers double by 2031 and um, so dementia will affect about one in 20 people over 65 uh, one in four people over 80, and not to forget the younger onset dementia, but 4,000 people in Ireland um, with younger onset dementia um, under 65. So our strategic priorities um, include to, to 2013 to expand um, our range and number of dementia services uh, for existing service users and those awaiting our services, and uh, we want to promote new service models based on innovative practice and comprehensive um, evaluation. So, as the general older population wishes to remain living in their own home, um, people with dementia also would like to remain living in their own homes. And um, yes, it's government policy to encourage this, um, but help is required. Um, so that could be in the form of uh, support for the carers, um, home help, daycare, respite, um, but of course also assistive technology can help us in this area. Um, so let's just look at some of the problems um, associated with um, living with dementia in your own home. So forgive me for the busyness of this slide, but um, on the left-hand side we have some of the underlying deficits um, that can occur with dementia. So you're looking at issues around um, sequencing, uh, memory and orientation and learning. And these can lead to um, problems in the home here in the middle with issues of your yeah, activities of daily living can be impaired when uh, dressing and washing, uh, taking medication. This can lead to... Um, problems with uh, cooker safety, uh, possibly wandering out of the house, um, and then also not to forget the interpersonal problems that can exist in the house where communication may not be optimum and um, where recognising people um, can lead to problems as well. So in terms of the consequence of these, we have um, possible physical um, well-being issues um, in terms of safety or security and health um, and other issues around uh, people's personal space. Um, and their social interaction being reduced. Um, also for the caregiver in the home as well, um, the care demands and the relationship with the, um, the person with dementia in the home, can, there's can, communication can break down and frustration can build and um, anxiety levels increase as well. So looking towards a solution, um, probably all know um, what our definition of assistive technology, but just to reiterate, we're looking at any device or system that allows an individual to perform a task that they would otherwise be unable to do, which, in, or which increases the ease and safety with which this task can be performed. So the term includes uh, straightforward low-tech standalone options and technology which is more high-tech and involves information and communication um, technology. So we um, began to look at this issue in um, 2007, um, we received some funding from the Dormant Accounts and um, partnered with Emergency Response. Um, we gave 65 packages of care to some of our clients, um, telecare, um, with the aim of assessing the person with dementia to create a tailor-made telecare package which would augment their existing care plan. Um, we wanted to facilitate um, the person with dementia to manage the risks associated with their cognitive disability. Um, we wanted to improve the life of the person with dementia, quality of life, and uh, we wanted to evaluate this also. So the equipment included a core package, um, and Dara's outlined some of the, uh, what would be in a core package, that like something simple as a pendant alarm, flood detectors, an exit sensor on the property, um, simple things like smoke detectors, um, a temperature extreme um, sensor, sensor and uh, pressure mats in the person's bed, and then some optional extras, um, including like fall detector, gas detector, or an additional property exit sensor. 
So among um, a range of questions we asked um, to the carers, they were asked about their caring role. And this graph shows um, that nearly 30% of the carers reported that the role had become much easier. Um, about 50% of the carers reported that their role had become a little easier. 18% said it hadn't changed and 5% said it had become more difficult. They also reported um, benefits through the semi-structured interviews around peace of mind. Uh, you can now sleep at night. You know if anything happens, you'll know about it. On one occasion, he fell asleep whilst cooking. Telecare woke him up. It would have been fatal only for telecare. It was a great benefit in alerting us when dad left the house during the night. My mother was embarrassed by his wandering out. He would often tell the staff who alerted her that things were all right. It gives me great peace of mind at night, and I know she's safe regarding the cooker or water being left on. It is of great benefit to me. So, in relation to our overall provision of telecare, we wanted to assess the level of involvement with the person with dementia. Um, so this graph shows that um, the person with dementia and the carer talked over the decision in just over 20% um, of the cases, and nearly 60% um, hadn't spoken over the decision with the person with dementia and just under 20% had. Um, however, when the um, package was in the home, nearly 60% of um, people with dementia were, were aware of telecare was in the home and about 40% were not. So what did we learn in this instance? Um, the carers were the main beneficiary of telecare in this instance. They spoke about reassurance and peace of mind. They slept better. They felt that um, they were safer that because the person was safer. Person with dementia, um, there was reported accident prevention, and um, there was no reported change in the independence of the person. So we began to think about balancing the needs and rights of um, the carer um, and the person with dementia. Um, just in relation to this, uh, staying with this project for a second, um, this initial project highlighted some inefficiencies in communication. That was the communication coming back to us at the Alzheimer's Society. So currently we've joined a European project with six other countries to um, look at this issue um, through an ICT service. Um, so our pilot on this um, doesn't begin until November. The evaluation will be much um, larger on this also. So the commu new communication tool basically allows um, our care coordinators to receive the information back as well as um, the alarm monitoring company um, so that we can tailor our um, care plans accordingly and we would hope that it um, also improves the communication. This tr communication would translate into better communication um, with people with dementia and their use of telecare. Um, basically, um, we want to enhance the lives of people with um, dementia. So, as Stevens mentioned earlier, there's new forms of telecare out every day. Um, there are mostly pros, but there are some cons. Um, and we need to consider the ethical considerations, particularly in relation to people with dementia. Um, we've been developing our position on this um, recently. So we would like our guiding principles to be that the person with dementia is the prime focus of the decision. We would like the, to have a holistic assessment of needs and um, wishes before the decision is taken to use assistive technology in the future. Um, we would like the freedom and rights of the person with dementia to be respected, um, that they have a right to their dignity, bodily integrity, privacy and autonomy. Um, and we would like that the person's past and present wishes where ascertainable are always considered. So in such a fast paced industry, it's great to have our um, Alzheimer's societies internationally doing research on this um, also and for us to learn from it. So one great example um, is this, um, the Alzheimer's Society in Australia are looking at the Safe to Walk program. And this is around the use of GPS system, which is a global positioning system. So it's basically like a, a monitoring. You can tell where someone is at all times. You can tell I'm not very technical, but 40% of people with dementia will become lost um, at some time. Um, the ability to continue to walk independently is um, hugely important to a person's um, well-being, self-esteem, physical health. And obviously becoming lost can be very traumatic for the person themselves, the carer and their family. Um, but through the use of the safe to walk device, it's envisaged that um, the people with dementia can maintain um, their independence and that the carer can also have peace of mind. So 
there's a huge, there's an ethical debate around the use of GPS for people living with dementia. Um, and obviously the Alzheimer's Society in Australia had to consider um, these ethical considerations as well, and they did so under the headings of consent and constraint and con confidentiality. So really the ethical debate around the use of a GPS system was, um, does the device deny the opportunity for personal space or autonomy, or does it provide um, a safe opportunity for the continued pursuit of a le leisure activity such as walking? Um, so in their research they have found to date, um, also mentioned that Stirling uh, University in Scotland are looking at a safe walking program as well, and we're in touch with them about it. So to date, uh, the research participants haven't expressed any eth ethical concerns. They've welcomed the use of the GPS location device. Um, they viewed it as a more person-centered solution um, to a difficult problem. They reported that allowing people to live with dementia the freedom to walk independently and to continue to carry out activities they have previously enjoyed can lead to reduction in any buildup of frustration, a decreased likelihood of withdrawal or loss of self-esteem or self-worth. Um, and even um, increased inclusion in society, while at the same time reducing the risk um, of becoming lost and harmed. So at present, um, we're not supplying um, GPS systems at the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland. However, we are advising on GPS system. And I've developed this um, decision tree just to help us with the device. We can just go through it quickly. So we'd like to, people to consider, first of all, what's the prime reason for using the location device? Um, what do you worry is likely to happen if the person doesn't use the location device? What's the likelihood of it happening? Have you um, considered other ways that this could be um, explored? So is the person with dementia able to make a decision around the use of a location device? If they are, we'd like them to um, discuss the decision with them and agree a way forward and remembering to check in with this decision. If no, we would like to know that the person ever expressed wishes or a likely decision regarding the use of location devices. Um, again, if yes, just respect it. If no, um, we want them to consider the following options. What were their values and opinions around privacy and personal dignity? Um, what value did they place on freedom and independence versus safety and security? Um, did their previous values influence the decisions, the decisions on location devices? Are there any implications for you legally or otherwise in making a decision on their behalf? And there, when a decision has been made, then we'd like these questions to be considered in that, um, where will the technology likely to be used? Um, where will the search take place? Um, which location device will be most appropriate? How much freedom of movement will the device allow? Um, can the person with dementia remove the device? Um, and who will be doing the monitoring and or locating. So in conclusion, you can see how fast this industry is growing and uh, the challenges and opportunities it presents to us in relation to our overall aim to provide a person-centered care. Um, so it's, it's very exciting for us, but it's also hugely challenging for us um, in the area of um, dementia care. So thank you for listening.